Thank you all for being here, and I'm, I'm hoping that the people online can hear me too. Uh, my name is, for those of you who are new, how many of you, this is your first Spaceport Live? Ooh, wow. Okay, well, great. Well, welcome. Welcome to Rice. Welcome to the, the Houston Spaceport Frontiers Lecture. Uh, my name is David Alexander. I'm a professor in the Physics and Astronomy Department. I'm also the director of the Rice Space Institute. And I think since about, we've run this series from since 2011. So we'll be going quite a while. Uh, so, so great speakers, and we're keeping that trend up uh, with tonight's speaker. Um, but since 2013, um, we've been supported uh, very generously by the Houston Spaceport and Arturo Machuca, who is the director of the Houston Spaceport as well. And if you don't follow what's happening with the Houston Spaceport, Arturo gave a talk maybe a year or so ago, so it's recorded on the YouTube channel. But it's very exciting to know what's, uh, to see what's going on. So before I introduce the next speaker, um, I just want to give you a couple of little things. If I was NASA, I'd tell you where all the bathrooms and where all the exits are, and there's no fire alarm plan. <laughs> but I don't know any of that, so you are taking the chances. <laughs> um, the door's that way. Um, but uh, if you if you see us on, I'd like to if you're on or, or if you give, well, send it to me. If you send me your address, if you want to be part of our mailing list, we'll make sure you're on the, the Spaceport Lecture mailing list. And just to let you know, we only use that to tell people about the talks. We don't try and sell you t-shirts or, you know, ask for donations or, you know, dog sitting or whatever it is you need. So, um, so if you're interested, then we've got a good series lined up um, coming up. There will be a change to, we I kind of proposed or uh, promoted a, a, a talk for October 5th on campus. We've moved that to October 4th at the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences so we can use a planetarium. So uh, you'll see a notice there. Um, I'm going to give, since you all took the time to come here, I'm going to give you a big tip in a second. Um, that talk is going to be on preparing for the, the solar eclipses that are about to come through Texas. October 14th is the annual eclipse, and April 8th is the, uh, is the total eclipse. And so Professor Wright, who is the founding director of the uh, Wright Space Institute, is going to be giving a talk on how to safely and carefully uh, observe an eclipse. Basic hint is don't look directly at the sun. Um, but you'll tell you go through all of that. Here's the big hint. Because it's a museum, it's a different process. We don't charge. We get free food, but we know free food. The first 50 who register gets a free ticket. So when I, I'll be sending out the information. If you're really interested uh, and you're interested, you can pay to go. We may actually, we may actually be able to do a few more. But um, that's the big tip, right? First 50 and gets a free ticket. What time is that? Um, it's probably going to be seven o'clock on October fourth. I can't remember if they've moved it to seven thirty. But like I said, I'm still working. Uh, we just kind of decided that that's what I'd like. That's what we'd like to do. Normally, I'd like to have them on rights. I like to have uh, access for for free because we get the the support of, of the spaceport. Um, but the eclipse is really important, and the museums are a really important part of that. And being able to access a planetarium will really bring it a little bit closer to home. So, so I think it'll be really, a, really a lot of fun. I'm still working on November fifth, uh, Guy Fox night. So I'll bring your fireworks, and um, I'm still waiting for that. I'm waiting to hear back from a very interesting gentleman, who is the same nationality as a number of people in the audience. Um, we actually have a group of uh, startup companies from Italy. Um, visiting Houston for eight weeks and being trained up at the ION. I was lucky enough to host them yesterday. They're here in the audience tonight too. So, um, so that will be November 5th if we can if we can make that work. And then November 30th, we're going to be talking about how you build stuff, how you do it in space manufacturing. So we're going to have a, the CEO of Think Orbital, which is a, a company by someone who came from SpaceX to create this company. Um, they just recently uh, were awarded the NASA um, agreement. And uh, they'll be coming to Houston to talk about that. So hopefully we'll see you there too. And then we'll have another eclipse talk in January, but this will be about the science. This will be from an astronomy professor. Um, and we'll talk about the science of eclipses. And I've already got my eye on a few people for uh, the subsequent lectures. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, some of them are in the audience. OK, so I take a long time to do this. But again, welcome. Um, the person uh, we're going to hear from tonight uh, Really, really interesting gentleman. I'm going to read his bio in a, a little bit a second. But I've known Nick 
for a number of years in a number of different roles. Mm -hmm. And it's always been good to get to, you know, he's always been very uh, insightful about what he brings to the table. You learn from him. And he can tell you some of that if you're interested. But really, um, now that we've started working a little bit closer together in certain areas, I really wanted to make sure that he was one of our speakers. That he, as busy as he is, he graciously uh, agreed to, to give our opening uh, season uh, Spaceport Lecture for, for this academic year. So thank you personally. Um, and you can all thank him at the end, and you can welcome him once I've done the work. So Mr. Nick Scaland is the Chief Technologist uh, at NASA Johnson Space Center, and also the Director of the Business Development and Technology Integration Office, as if Chief Technologist wasn't enough. Um, he's focused on helping NASA return to the moon through technology development, technology transfer, which is always a big challenge, and strategic partnerships. Thinking rice here, mate, just so you know. Um, and throughout his career, he's trained astronauts, designed next generation spacesuits, developed open source technology, led missional movements, and created some of the largest purpose driven collaborations in history. Uh, he's well known for launching leading and successful cutting edge initiatives, random hacks of kindness, International Space Apps Challenge, which was a huge event across the world, and National Day of Civic Hacking. Um, he also advises organizations on how to navigate the future by developing forward-leading strategies, convening communities, and developing missional technologies. He's an avid adventurer, experienced diver, and a dedicated triathlete who has completed 23 Ironman races. And by the kind permission of his wife and three children, he is here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Nick Scott. All right, well, I am super, super excited to be here tonight. And um, I think we actually have two agreements in place already with Rice University, but we can do a third if you'd like. <laughs> so uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. All right, can everyone hear me online OK? Give me a shout out if you can hear me online. I'm watching you on the, on the chat here. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, man, let me just say I'm super excited and honored to be here. Um, if this, how many of, this, of you is this your first lecture in this series? Wow, that's a lot of you. So um, I stayed up really late last night, not only because I was preparing for this talk, but because I started watching all of the other lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that I am very fortunate to be here today because there are so many amazing people who have been here before me. So I highly encourage you to go back and check out the other lectures. Um, there have been some amazing ones from former you know, administrators, deputy administrators of NASA, um, people at Johnson Space Center running big programs like Gateway, uh, people in the space economy uh, representing the space industry. There's a lot to learn from, from these folks. So I was like, man, what am I going to talk about that hasn't already been said in a room full of amazing people? And by the way, this room is really interesting. Looking out, and I can't see all of you all in the ether, but I can tell you in the room, we have people who, when I started my career 20 Three years ago, I'm so getting so old now, uh, there were mentors of mine in the room, and honestly, they should be giving this talk. And I'm just you know, thankful to be here for that. There are some in the room that have, maybe this is your first experience with, with space exploration and with NASA and with the space economy and all that's going on. So I'm really going to try to give a talk to that's interesting to everybody. We'll see how this goes. Um, so um, today, I want to talk about going further. And I want to talk about what the future of human space flight looks like in 2040. So have you ever thought about the world in 2040? And it's kind of far out there. It's 17 years out there. It's, it's, that's what we're going to think about today. So I, I hope I can stretch your imagination a bit. So next slide, please. So as the chief technologist at Johnson Space Center, um, I have the privilege of having really a front row uh, seat and to, to witness what's going on in the space industry and all the innovations that are shaping the future of human space flight. So I find myself at the, the intersection of cutting edge technology and these boundless aspirations that we as a humanity have for expanding our presence across the solar system. And I can tell you that right now, and maybe you don't know this, but right now there is a pivot point in humanity, in human history. And it's really, really exciting. Like we are just really starting the narrative of space exploration and, and really rewriting what this looks like as our existence as we expand outside of the confines of Earth. And so that's it's really exciting. I've had, uh, as David mentioned, a lot of interesting uh, positions at NASA over the year. In 23 years, I've, I've spent some time training astronauts at, at our neutral buoyancy laboratory. It's 6.2 million gallon pool that we have here at Johnson Space Center. 
I've led our open government initiative, thinking about how we can apply data science and open data and open, uh, open source software to help with space exploration. Um, I've led our data science initiative at the agency. As David mentioned, I, I'm really interested in convening citizens around the world um, to help advance the mission of exploration. And so for that, we, we launched the International Space Apps Challenge, which happens every year in October with 20, 25,000 people around the world in 200 cities who are all contributing their time, their talent, their, their attention to helping uh, advance human spaceflight. And so uh, most recently, I've been in this, in this office as the chief technologist, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means at Johnson Space Center. Uh, but overall, if you go to the next slide, in our office, we are all about going further. You know, even in the chief technologist role, again, there's way more capable and competent and qualified people who have filled this position before me. And so we, we're, we're trying to understand what could we do in this season that hasn't been done before. And I think it's really wrapped up in simply go further than before. We really believe it's possible. And, and the things that have been impossible before, we want to make them possible. Some days that's easy, some days that's hard, but that's, that's our goal. And so we talk about that all day in the office. And again, I do not believe that there's a more exciting time to be alive right now because of what we're doing in space exploration. So next slide. So in my role as the chief technologist, I oversee the technology portfolio, but I also am in this role of leading our office of business development. And that's really just kind of a fancy way of saying managing all the activity and the partnerships that we have uh, with, with companies and academia and even citizens uh, that are helping advance uh, space exploration. So NASA is really busy pioneering our new missions that are go will go to the moon and to Mars, um, but we're also working on a lot of technology breakthroughs um, in propulsion and robotics and artificial intelligence and ultimately all these things will set the stage for humanity to take that next giant leap. So we think about ourselves as the front door to Johnson Space Center. And so for those of you that have worked at Johnson Space Center before, there's been different iterations of the partnerships office, different iterations of the chief technologist office. But one thing we did in the last year is create a new office that I lead, it's on the ninth floor, that is literally the front door. We want to make it easy to work with government, which I know sounds crazy, but we are making progress where it's not crazy difficult to work with us. So that's what we are focused on in my office at Johnson Space Center. So if you ever have a question, and you don't know who to talk to at JSC, reach out to me, reach out to my team. We would love to help you uh, just uh, engage with the center and what we're doing, whether it's just kind of sharing what we're doing like today, or whether it's a partnership, um, if you're a startup or your university or your business, um, if you're another government agency, welcome uh, from another country. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we we want to work with the world for the peaceful purposes of outer space. So next slide, please. So I was looking back at past lectures, and there's, as I mentioned, so much discussion before um, on on what we as NASA are doing as part of the space economy, which you know that's a you know in 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 like six or seven years is, is projected to be you know a, a trillion dollar industry. And it's growing, and NASA's budget's a measly $25 billion. So we're, once we were the leaders in human spaceflight, today we're more kind of like the conveners, the hub of human spaceflight, because there's so much that's happening. And that's really, really good. We want that, want that to be the case. So I was looking back at some of the lectures. It's really interesting, because I look back you know, over, what, 10 years you've been doing this? And there's a lot of discussion in previous lectures about destinations, where NASA's going, and we are still going places to the moon and to Mars. But I think I want to start today by recentering the conversation about what our actual goal for human space exploration is. Because it's a really compelling goal, and it's a conviction that drives all that we're doing at NASA, from the science uh, to the inspiration to even the, the work we're doing to you know position ourselves nationally as a, a leader in the world. And that is. It's these words, our, our mission, our goal, is to extend human presence across the solar system. It's amazing if you think about that. We don't wanna just stop at the moon, we don't wanna just stop at Mars. Our intention is to sustainably help humans live off of the planet. Now that will very, uh, for very good reasons, start in the, with the moon, but eventually we wanna go elsewhere. And so this, I think this aspiration really symbolizes the human curiosity that drives all of us. It's our drive as humans to conquer big challenges and to, 
to pursue the unknown, these new frontiers. And so venturing into space is, I mean, I think important for seeking the fundamental you know, questions about the cosmos and about science, but it's also about the ins inspiring the next generation and helping our nation continue to be a positive global influence uh, in an increasingly de decisive world. So today, I wanna talk about 2040. Next slide, please. Why is 2040 so important? So that's 17 years from now. So those in the room that are over the age of like 30, because under that you're, you maybe <laughs> have a hard time remembering where you were, but where were you 17 years ago? Think about that. 17 years ago, that's kind of a long time. What, has anything changed? Has anything surprised you? Does anything exist today that you could not have predicted 17 years ago? Does your, does your world look different? Your life look different? It's very interesting. Does Houston look different? I mean, I think in that entire time they've been working on I-45. <laughs> so maybe that's the same. But beyond that, I mean, the city of Houston even just looks different, right? And so when we think forward to 2040, it holds significance, um, one, because that is far enough into the future that really challenges our imagination. You know, it's, it's a good time where the moon and Mars line up and it's easier to get to places. And that's why maybe you hear Elon Musk or others uh, talk about a future of humans living on places like Mars and they'll, they'll put that in the 20, 40, 50 time frame. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll talk about these aspirations, but that's, it's, a, it's good to frame it that way. But I think more, more than anything, it, it helps us think about um, things that are not quite possible yet, or they are possible, we just haven't got there yet in our own mind. And that's because, next slide, well, as the famous Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, the philosopher said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And I think humans, this is one of the, the, the conditions of being a human, it's one of the things that makes us human is we tend to be really, really nearsighted. We have a hard time with vision. We personally have a hard time thinking just five years ahead. And I always flip it around, you know, you're in a job interview and they're like, hey, where will you be? Where do you see yourself in five years? You're like, well, I mean, kind of hope I'm still here employed <laughs> with this job and married and have kids and in the same home. I mean, you really project your current situation into the future five years and kind of hope it's the same. Because we as humans, we love comfort. We do not like change. We want things to be the same, right? So, but if you look again, five years ago, don't even go 17 years ago, five years ago, has anything changed? So it's often like exploring in a snowstorm. We're really nearsighted. And what I encourage people to do when you don't know where you're going and then the, the future is really unclear is simply take a step forward. That's all you gotta do. You gotta go just a little bit further because if we're honest with ourselves, we're all pretty nearsighted and we have to think about that short-sightedness and what it means, that tunnel vision that we have in our own lives, but also in, the, in, in what we're doing with space exploration. So if you go to the next side, our goal is to be farsighted, to have an ability to envision a better future, to articulate that future, uh, to, to have it be impactful, not only for our own selves, but for all of humanity. And so if you think about leaders, the leaders that you might look up to just in society over the past 20, 50 years, you might, you might think about Martin Luther King, who was farsighted when he had his speech, I have a dream. Or you might think about Walt Disney, when he created the parks and the amazing, the amazing things that he's done in California and Florida and around the world. You might think about Steve Jobs, the first time he walked up on stage and held up the iPhone. Or before that, you know, all the other things he held up before that. You might think about Bill Gates when he was working you know, in a garage and trying to put a computer on every desk in every home when that seemed like the most ridiculous and possible dream ever. You might think about JFK, right here at Rice University, sharing his vision for putting a man on the moon before the decade was over. You might think about Ernest Shackleton. Who knows Ernest Shackleton? Man, I love that story. Ernest Shackleton is such a great story of adventure, but it's also one that was like, a failure and he had to keep his team alive and he had enough vision to walk through the snowstorm to just keep going forward. So each of these leaders knew where they were headed and they didn't know all the details but they had enough vision to know where that they were going. So uh, next slide, what happens if we're not farsighted? 
What happens with leaders who are short-sighted? You know, we, we talk a lot at NASA, and actually in this forum here, Steve Rader, um, who is a, a fellow NASA colleague, he was talking about, he was making the case here for why innovation matters. And he noted in his talk that in the last 15 years, 52% of Fortune 500 companies, these are companies in the top 500, very successful companies, have gone extinct. And if you look at the average lifespan of companies, in 2018, the average lifespan of successful companies was 18 years. Think about that, the average. So in 17 years from now, in 18 years from now, the world's gonna look totally different. Today, that's actually down to 14 years. And so it's that average lifespan of not all companies, just the successful ones is decreasing. And so, you know, we have powerful examples like Kodak, right? 25 years ago, Kodak declared bankruptcy because along came the cell phone and everybody had a, a, a camera on their phone. You know, we, we talk about electric vehicles and the promise that has to really disrupt uh, the energy industry. That's a big topic here in Houston, Texas. Um, the classic example is Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster was overcome by uh, Netflix and Amazon came along and really disrupted the mom and pop shops. Disruption, change, it's the only constant. And the, the concern I have is that when it comes to space exploration, we don't have enough vision for where we're going. So this talk today is all about vision. And I don't have all the answers because it's really impossible to predict the future. But what we can do is put our futurist hats on and think like a futurist and, and think about some plausible scenarios and then consider what that means for us today. So next slide. I had, a, I had a mentor once who said you can only see as far into the future as you can see into the past or you can understand into the past. And I was thinking about that. And if you think about the last 60 years of human spaceflight, it might seem like a long time. And we landed on the moon and we've had space stations. We had the entire space shuttle program. Generations of leaders have come and left. There's a lot that has happened. But in, in, if you kind of zoom out and look at all of humanity, that is just a, just a breath, just a blink. And so then you consider, well, what, what about the next 60 years? I mean, that really is just the start of this narrative of space exploration for, for our, our grandkids, right? That'll look very different than it does today. So, I mean, just in the past year, I believe, SpaceX has launched 80 plus rockets. So they've launched 350 rockets since 2018. 2018, that's six years ago, five years ago. They, they hadn't even launched like they do today. And how, how normalized are we already to being like, oh, there's SpaceX, there's another, another launch, right? So that's what we think a lot about at NASA, at Johnson Space Center in my office. If you go to the next slide, we talk about this idea of giant leaps start here. Giant leaps start in the room with us. And so I wanna, I wanna think through a few possible scenarios for the future of human spaceflight in 2040. Maybe, maybe this is new, maybe it's not. If you're in the space industry, these probably, you're probably gonna be like, yeah, Nick, we talk about this all the time. We do, we have a vision for where we're going, but maybe not everybody realizes just how compelling that vision is. So the first thing, next slide. By 2040, we really see human presence sustained elsewhere, beyond Earth, for the first time ever, right? Now this could include permanent lunar bases or habitats where astronauts, just a, a couple astronauts, are living and working for extended times, but that's really kind of the bear market. The bull market is much more of a, of a bet about humanity living sustainably, where we have communities living on lunar bases. We have a lot of other countries beyond the US that are thinking this way too. Europe, China, Russia. And so we're in Houston, we're all about human space exploration. And so we're really focused on Houston being a hub for the activity around human space exploration. And that includes not only NASA, but all the universities and companies that are doing work in this space as well. I mean, you go to the next slide. Steve Altimus, uh, the CEO of one of the companies here in Houston, Texas, uh, called Intuitive Machines. He presented here, I think, last November. Was that two Novembers ago? Last November. And he was talking about the importance and really the imperative of the lunar surface really as a high ground for the U.S. If you think about any frontier, it's the governments who get there first that really have the high ground. And you think about all the advantages 
of what that means for the country. And I think for us here in Houston and for us in Texas, we really get this. And there's a lot of investments right now. You may have heard about this, maybe you haven't, but there's a lot of energy in Houston around the spaceport, around Johnson Space Center with universities, with the state of Texas making big investments in the future of human spaceflight because we get this, we get that, this imperative. And when it comes to space exploration, it's the human part of space exploration that's really, really important in the future. And so we're excited at NASA about just kind of starting to really make progress and momentum with the Artemis uh, program when it comes to launching humans back to the moon. You know, just last fall we had, um, we, we celebrated the first launch of Artemis 1 as a 1.4 million mile, 25 day mission. It was really the first time in 50 years that we as a country placed humans in orbit um, or not, not humans, the first time we've launched a rocket in orbit. Now we're preparing for Artemis 2, which will be the first time we, we place humans in orbit. And then Artemis 3 will be the first time we land on the moon. So um, could you flip over to the video? I have a video about Artemis and um, I wanna, want you guys to check that out because it does a much better job explaining the different parts of Artemis and how we're actually going to go back to the moon. Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew and heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go for mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days to work all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. 
But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies behind. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. Um, it's a very good video. But so you, in Houston, Texas, here at Johnson Space Center, again, the hub for human spaceflight, we, those major program elements of Artemis are represented here. So we have uh, the Orion program, that's the capsule that the astronauts are flying in. We have the Gateway program, that's the space station that we're building around the moon. We have, of course, the International Space Station program, which has been here for decades, and they're, the one, they're in low Earth orbit. We also have other programs that are really important for uh, the commercial industry. Um, that includes the commercial lunar payload system, um, it's, it's, I, I like to think about it, I'll probably get in trouble, but it's like Amazon to the moon. It's like when you, you get a package at your front door, it's like we're going to deliver stuff to the moon. I'm pretty sure I'm not allowed to say it that way, but that's how I think about it. Um, we also have uh, commercial destinations. So numerous commercial companies, private companies, are building other space stations, in addition to Gateway and the ISS, other destinations that tourists and Others can go to and, and do research or just use for other purposes. If you go to the next slide, that it leads kind of the second thing is all of this activity is a stepping stone to Mars. Mars is much harder to get to, and this image right here is so aspirational. It's one of the only images in this talk that's not my own my own image. This is a SpaceX image and kind of how they were, they're thinking about what it could look like on colonizing the Mars in the next 100 years, right? But so much has to happen for this to be the case. But by 2040, I think it's really, really, really reasonable to think that humans might put their first footprints on Mars. And having a sustainable presence on the moon is such a key part of, of doing that. So you go to the next slide. I mentioned the thriving space industry. In 2040, we really anticipate a thriving space industry. We have a lot of companies represented right here in Houston, Texas. I mentioned Intuitive Machines before. They're part of the Commercial Lunar Payload System program. They're working on launching payloads to the moon that will launch um, in the next year. It's really, really exciting. We also have companies like Axiom. If you know where Fry's is, down I-45 towards NASA, well, the old Fry's is now an Axiom building. And we also have Collins, and they're building spacesuits. So NASA's not building the suits anymore. We have companies that are building suits. And these companies are located near Ellington Field, which is now the spaceport, right by Johnson Space Center. There's an entire ecosystem of commercial companies that are finding their homes in Houston, Texas. Another great example I always love to point out is Venus Aerospace. Um, they're not necessarily humans to the moon, but they are looking at hypersonic flight 
and making flying to Japan a lot easier um, through technology advances. So there's a lot of stuff going on here in Houston. And a big part of 2040 is having that robust uh, commercial space economy, to, which is really part of our goals with the Artemis program. So if you go to the next slide, then it kind of leads to space tourism. So how many of you, if you could, would go to the moon? If we had a, have a, had a base on the moon? All right, I got two hands right there. All right, is that a one-way flight or a round trip? <laughs> All right, 58, or like, yeah. I also think, I mean, think about this, 2040, 17 years from now, it's very plausible that we would have a sustained human presence on the moon. What does that mean? Well, stuff happens on the moon. So maybe babies would be born on the moon. We could, for real, have a first generation of humans that have never visited Earth. It's a real possibility. Um, but space tourism is a big part of that. We're already launching private astronaut missions, not NASA, commercial companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are sending paying private citizens from around the world, not just the US, but citizens of other countries to space. Some of them are going up like a, like a pole vault and going up and then coming back down. Some of them are going up and going around the Earth. Um, some of them are actually going to the International Space Station and that is all happening today. And here in Houston, we have Axiom that is a big uh, player in the private astronaut missions. And the final thing I'll say about 2040, stuff that we can predict is this. Next slide. International collaboration. We already have um, quite a few international collaborations in place and we have a lot more um, coming through the Artemis Accords. We actually have eight countries that are the original signatories of that saying, yes, you know what, we want to stack hands on this idea of a sustainable presence on the moon. We want to be part of that. Since those eight signed, we have 20 other countries from around the world that have signed on. So we have 28 countries around the world that are part of this international collaboration. And the International Space Station, which has been flying since 1998, has numerous countries that have been part of that. And um, some countries that we have a hard time find, seeing eye to eye with um, in, in other ways, right? And so really the space program becomes this broker for world peace and, and what we can collectively do potential of humanity. It's really, really exciting. So that's all the stuff that's kind of predictable. If you go to the next slide. So what about the stuff that is kind of beyond our current imagination? Again, we're talking about 2040. I mean, you, you probably have heard those things, but I want to talk, I want to stretch our minds a little bit about what else could happen. Um, next slide. When oftentimes I give a talk as the chief technologist at Johnson Space Center, I'm talking about the areas of technology development that we really care about. Um, I manage an early stage portfolio, early stage investments, so the stuff that's like really, it's like an idea. We want to turn that into something that we might infuse into the mission. And we have a lot of areas where we invest in technology, like entry and descent landing systems and robotic technology, um, EVA systems, like the, the suits and the rovers that you need to explore the moon, um, digital technologies infused in all this. So this is often what I talk about, but today I want to, I want to highlight five other possibilities. So this is not on the bearish market look, but maybe the bullish market. If the space economy really takes off and we have more investment and more humans are flying to space regularly and we have a sustained human presence on the moon, where else could we conceivably go by 2040? So next slide. You know, we might very possibly extend um, human presence beyond the moon and Mars. Can you go to the next one? Working on it? She's doing a great job, right? <laughs> so we could have missions to asteroids. We could have missions to a Lagrange point. We could even potentially have missions to other planets um, in our solar system. And so there's, you know, the, the moons of Jupiter as an example, or the moon of, uh, or Titan as, as an example, the moon of, of Saturn. You know, there's a lot of places, and I don't know where this is, I just made up the image, but it's, it's somewhere that's not the moon, right? So a, a second thing that is very possible is that we'll have technology advances that right now, still today, is a really good idea, but we still can't figure out how to make it quite happen. The next slide is a picture of a space elevator. And so if you've ever heard about a space elevator, the concept is that um, it, it might revolutionize the way that we can get mass, things that are heavy, into space 
um, by simply stretching the cable, simply stretching the cable from Earth all the way into a geosynchronous orbit. And sometimes it looks like a cable, sometimes it's a ribbon. Right now, this is not technically possible. Even though this idea was developed in 1895, this is not a new idea, but today in 2023, it still costs like $10,000 a pound just for dirt to get to outer space. We really need to reduce the cost of sending stuff to space. So there's ideas like this. There's another company called Spin Launch, which is like just spin it really fast and throw it, throw it into space. And they, they're actually doing that. They, they can actually make a business case out of that. And so the space elevator and other ideas like it are, are possibilities that we might see breakthroughs in the next um, 17 years. The next slide. Um, there's a talk by Rick Tumlinson here, and, and he, he made a point that it's all about the resources. If we could just unlock the resources on the moon or on asteroids or on Mars, we would be able to do a lot of things. One, make a business case for commercial companies, but two, help humans live sustainably on those other planets. We could convert you know, uh, the regolith into drinking water and oxygen for breathing and hydrogen for rocket fuel. There's a lot of things that we can do. We call it in situ resource utilization, ISRU. And there's companies that are actually trying to do this as well. Um, and there's, you know, you can imagine autonomous robotic systems that are launched to the moon, that are mining the moon and processing those resources before humans ever get there. That's a very real possibility when we have autonomous vehicles and drones and 3D printers. It's just a matter of putting a lot of these things together. Next slide. One of the things that I love talking about right now because it's a very 2023 thing um, is machine intelligence. Um, these slides were made with machine intelligence. It's amazing what we can do and the impact that this might have on human space exploration. Everything from, again, autonomous space operations uh, to robotic exploration, but also just processing the data in ways that are much more efficient and that we can do on spacecraft rather than sending it all the way down to a mission control. You know, AI and machine learning, it probably has applications in things like planetary defense and being able to identify threats uh, sooner than we would normally be able to do. There's a lot of application with AI. We're actually gonna be doing a uh, talk, a workshop on AI at Rice University in November. And so you guys should check that out. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, on my LinkedIn page, I have a, a link to that. Um, the final thing I'll mention, and I'll just mention it because people much, much, much smarter than me know a lot more about it, but I'll mention it because it'll make me sound super cool as a chief technologist, and that is, the next slide is quantum. Quantum physics, quantum something, like the idea of quantum and these two particles existing and being entangled, and what does that mean? Well, there's real practical applications of this. It, you've probably heard of quantum computing, right? The idea that, Classical computers have this, you know, simulations and calculations that take a long time. Quantum computing promises to drastically improve our ability to, to, we'll probably have quantum computers on all of our phones faster than any of us can actually really imagine. But there's other applications of quantum, like quantum communication, the idea of secure and reliable communication in space flight. Um, there's quantum sensing is a big topic that we're thinking about at NASA right now. Like how do you put quantum sensors on satellites and what does that, what does that allow us to do from a sensing capability? There's a lot of interesting applications in the future. So next slide. Whenever I give a talk, I like to talk about the fact that a lot of people think about NASA as being a whole bunch of rocket scientists and smart people and pioneers doing these really cool things and you love showing up and hearing about it but I really want to encourage you to consider your role in space exploration because we know that innovation starts with people. We know that not all the smartest people are in the room at NASA. We know that innovation usually actually comes from other places outside of the silos that we have and, and what's, what's you know, available to us right now. So we really want you to think about that. And so next slide. There's a lot of unsolved problems. If you're looking for something to do, you're kind of bored, you're not sure what you're going to do in your life, I encourage you to check out space exploration. There's a lot of really interesting challenges out there. I'll give you a few of them. Next slide. First of all, with all these rockets, the Blue Origins, the SpaceX's, the Fireflies, everybody in between, who's going to manage all this? If I have anything to say about it, it will not be NASA. 
<laughs> we will not be in the business of managing space traffic, but somebody needs to, right? As space gets more and more crowded, effective space tra uh, management systems need to be in place to prevent collisions and prevent debris buildup. Who's gonna manage that? Maybe, maybe that's you, maybe that's a company that you could start. Next slide, space health. This is an area uh, that we do a lot of work in at Johnson Space Center, the Human Research Program, thinking about, you know, if we're living on the moon or Mars, there's this pesky problem, there's a lot of pesky problems, but there's this one really big pesky problem uh, for long duration spaceflight called radiation. And there's a lot of different types of radiation. And when you get beyond our planet and beyond low Earth orbit, this becomes a really, really big deal. Now you might think, well, we just can't travel to space. We can actually still travel to space, but it's a big enough problem that, you know, it might have some major impacts on human life. And we really need to solve this. And when I look around in the field of technology and what's happening, there's a lot of mitigation ideas for space radiation, but it's a problem that's so complex and wieldy that we really haven't solved it. And so if you're looking for a Nobel Peace Prize, or a Nobel Prize uh, I, I encourage you to check out space radiation. Another one that I think is really cool is, um, anybody have an interest in architecture? Does anyone like designing your homes and your spaces? If you go to the next slide, think about what it would be like to build habitats on the moon. If we have a sustainable presence, we probably need to build some places to live. There's a lot of different ideas for how we do that. I love shipping containers, and I've never seen an idea, a concept for shipping containers on the moon, so I made one. So this is my shipping container uh, settlement on the moon. And I don't know what it could look like. There's a lot of different ways to use the regolith or to launch things. Um, into space, into the moon, uh, for humans to live in something. But also advances in robotics and 3D printing and autonomous systems allow us to maybe send stuff up there, use the regolith, and build habitats, which also, by the way, is a mitigation for space radiation, so that's helpful. Another one that matters deeply is concepts like nuclear propulsion, solar sails, advanced ion drives, I'll the next slide, things that technology, propulsion technology that shortens the time to travel between the places in space that are really, really far apart from one another. And so there's a lot of work being done at this. Um, Johnson Space Center, Glenn Research Center in the DOD, the Department of Energy. There's a lot of really interesting research when it comes to advanced propulsion. And finally, the last big challenge I'll mention, and you might, you might have a sense of this already, but there's a lot of stuff in space. There's a lot of satellites, uh, just Starlink, for example, is launching more satellites into space than ever before. And I don't have the number, but in the past like three years, it's just proliferated, right? There's so much that's happening, so much debris. The problem is that when these things hit each other, if you go to the next slide, they can create a self-perpetuating problem known as, known as the Kessler syndrome, which is essentially space junk hits each other and creates more space junk. And that can cause really big problems for satellites, for astronauts, for mission planners, for space tourists, anybody trying to go to outer space to explore space. So how do we deal with that? We don't have a good solution to that. There, this could be a business opportunity. It could be something that the government funds. There's a lot of opportunity in thinking through these big challenges. And it's entrepreneurs that aren't held back by visions of just the next couple of years, but ha can have enough vision to think about the future that are gonna solve these problems, these challenges that will really allow us to extend human presence throughout the solar system. So that's just some of the ideas that I have on 2040, but thinking about this talk and thinking about like what holds us back the most, I think there's one thing, if you go to the next slide, it's the past. So the thing about humans is that we are really, really, really bad about holding on to the past. We use it oftentimes as a justification not to take a step in that blizzard because it's, you know, we're kind of scared of what it looks like. It's easier to just stay in our house. We don't want to get out in the snowstorm. We're really, really bad at holding on to the past. Change, it can be unsettling. It can be disruptive. Therefore, we humans love the status quo, right? We love comfort. We love maintaining that comfort. We love predictability. We love minimizing risks. 
We like to avoid losses. We don't, we're kind of averse to losses, which means we don't take sometimes even calculated risks. And so all of that is a threat to our future. And so I really want us to learn from our past, but be courageous and willing to step forward. And that starts with each and every one of us, right? All of us probably are comfortable in some way. Maybe it's comfortable with something. Maybe you, maybe you got a PhD in a field uh, of technology and you're, you're the world expert in that. Your job is to expand your knowledge, expand the knowledge for humanity, explore the frontiers of that field, of that discipline. Think about how that can apply to other disciplines, right? And so if we collectively were to do that, to take one step forward, and we do that here in Houston, Texas, I really believe that we will see by 2040 a sustained human presence on the lunar surface, the first generation born on another planet, uh, maybe those first footprints on Mars, maybe human presence at that point will be extended elsewhere. So with that, uh, next slide, I think in the grand scheme of things, what matters is when we look at 2040, um, that's again 17 years from now, some of you will have grandchildren, some of you already have grandchildren, what stories about space exploration are we going to be able to tell them in 2040? That starts here, and that starts now, and we're really at a tipping point, and I want you guys to really consider being part of that. So consider your role, uh, the impact you could have, and we would love to work with you at NASA. So with that, I have a one last really great slide for questions. Um, does, do we have any questions? We got one in the back. Wait, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't know. Is there, is there a possible way to get questions online or should we yeah, only get take questions in there? I don't know. We can get them over in the chat. Okay. Um, you can see why I invited them and why I invited them to open up uh, our season. So thank you very much. We forgot to quote another yoga, Yogi Berra quote, which is the future ain't what it used to be. Yeah, that's and true. I think, I think he's shown us what it could be and, and how we go to do that. And as he, as he gave us a nice plug for our lectures that are online already. In fact, I'm looking at uh, Professor uh, Scott Solomon there. We talked about what it might be like to be a human on Mars in the future. So you can go back and look at some of our talks. This is going to be one of the highlights too. So again, thank you. Thank you, Nick. It's yeah. a great pleasure having you here. And now we can open, if you're online, um, use the Q&A and we'll, we'll try and make sure we read one or two of them out. Um, we are a bit time pressed this particular evening because as I said, he's wife gave him permission, but he can only stay out past the, uh, not past Yeah, the I have a deadline, so, so, a um, curfew. So, sorry, there was a question from the audience and if you could, we're going to have to bring up a mic so that everyone can hear it and maybe for the online you can maybe read the question. <laughs> Um, so the question is, is there a current realistic Artemis schedule update? So I can tell you that there's a lot of people at NASA that work really, really, really hard on those schedules and um, they release them when they can release them. And so I think the current projection is, you know, it was 2024. Now I think we're saying 2025. I think that is still the current projection. Um, there's a lot of things that have to fall into place for that to happen. You know, the Artemis 2 crew is already obviously training. They'll be launching soon. And then Artemis 3 crew is yet to be named. Um, and so I don't know if I can answer it any more definitively than that to say we all want to see it happen and we're working as hard as we can now. Of course, unfortunately, in space exploration, uh, we are a government agency. And oftentimes, a government agency is really affected by budgets. And so when we are unable to pass a budget, you know, as a country, for example, that can impact things, right? And so we're always constantly balancing that. And so again, I, I encourage all of you to use your voice and vote for space exploration because it's important. Thankfully, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue and a challenge that both Democrats and Republicans on both sides really I think we have a lot of support, but we still have a lot of challenges to do things like that. So, I can't kill me. We'll yeah. bounce backwards and forwards, so you can be next. But a very, very quick question. Yeah. And I think, given the timing of it, it was the very first slide. The question was who's the artist for that fabulous astronaut image? So, I think that was your opening slide. Oh, right. Yes. So, the question is who is the artist for the astronaut image on the very first slide? It's a great question. Who is the artist? Is it AI or is it Nick? 
It's a big debate. Um, so I, I, I was again. I was trying to think of. I was trying to think of how to make this talk different than you've seen before. So all these slides are created last night at like 2 a.m. Um, using Midjourney, which is an open AI, open AI product. Um, I really encourage you to go check it out and try it out. And it, and it really it shows what can be done. Um, through using technology, the visualizations were pretty pretty cool. So, and that also raises the point that some of you are scientists, some of you are engineers, some of you are the artists and the communicators, and this is the key aspect that made us so well. In addition to all these other things, so so again, you know, spaces. We need everybody to contribute in many different ways. And with that, I'll pass on to Aki, and you can ask your question. Uh, how is GSC using AI right now in its internal processes? Besides doing slides, mm -hmm. and also do we have partnerships with OpenAI right now? So, how are we using what, what did you say? AI in the AI. processes? Yeah, yeah. And uh, are, we, are you using OpenAI's APIs and integration somehow? Yeah. In partnerships with them? Yeah, so the question is like, are we partnering with OpenAI? How are we using AI, machine learning, all of this great new technology? Um, so, I think like all organizations, a lot of this technology is really new, right? And so, I think a lot of people are really just starting to experiment with it. So I don't actually know, um, Ali, you are online, you can tell me maybe really quick, look it up, do we have a partnership with OpenAI? I'm pretty sure we do not yet. Um, we are prototyping tools, and I think OpenAI is one of them, um, as part of the ChatGBT4, right? Um, as part of a suite of tools that we could provide um, to our employees, but there's a lot of experimentation going on. Now, there is a lot of official projects as well. So we have a big, uh, we have a, a catalog of the digital type projects that are using AI. And as you can imagine, it's pretty much in every field. I mean, think about AI and what it doesn't impact. I mean, I can think of everything, even just like the efficiency of seat, seating in this auditorium, or the fact like badging. Instead of badging in, it just automatically detects you and, and based on the data. There's so much that we could do with AI, AI. And the same thing with human exploration, right? In the rockets, in the rovers, heads up displays for spacesuits, um, in the way we do our business operations, it's embedded in everything. Um, so now I tell you, we at NASA don't have like a chief AI officer yet. Should we? Is that the role of the chief technologist, or the role of the chief data officer, or the role of the chief scientist? And that's a conversation that we're having. Like, what does this look like, and how do we structure ourselves to best take advantage of it? But it's exciting, right? I really encourage everybody to um, use the tools. In fact, my kids who are 12 and 11, you know, when, when a lot of the stuff first came out, they were like, oh man, what do we do with like this technology in school? And I'm like, no matter what your teacher tells you, I want you to use this technology. I want it to be a superpower. Like I want you to be comfortable using it because we're just at the beginning stages of it, and I think it's so powerful. It, it really could it could change everything. You may not actually need a person to be the head of that particular. <laughs> That's a fantastic so, idea. Would you guys are thinking about some stuff? I see a question. Let me go online first, please, and then we'll come back. Um, so this is I'm going to, it's a kind of long question. I'm going to shorten it a little bit. So. This is basically saying there's two ways to land on the moon. There's the staging way that you talked about because of the need for gateway, but there's also the uh, the uh, starship way where you just basically launch from the Earth and go straight to the moon. So the question is, um, are both a reality or just one of them? Yeah, they're both definitely a reality. Um, and I think we want, so if, if you paid attention a little bit in the talk, NASA wants a lot of options, right? We learned in the past um, just based on how everything kind of played out that you know having all of your eggs in one basket isn't great We want options. In fact, we don't want all the options to be owned by NASA We want options that aren't owned by NASA at all, right? So we want we want options and I think the commercial space industry has a lot of options and Some of those things are completely independent of what NASA is doing. And that's really really good So I think they're definitely both still on the plane plane cards right now Yes NASA shirt, you win. Good job. Um, I'm an undergrad here with an interest in physics, so I was wondering about the practical uses of physics and um, art specifically, and if um, you know, a student like me could somehow get engaged with it. Yeah, so you can definitely get engaged. We have a lot of different ways inside NASA, but also just in the entire space industry, right? Um, Artemis is a program with a lot of elements to it. And there's a lot of ways, you know, in terms of the technology development, the research that's being done, 
um, and then just even applying that to the operations. So Johnson Space Center is a big programmatic and operations center. So a lot of the energy goes to flying the spacecraft, keeping humans alive in space. But we also have a lot of research that happens at Johnson Space Center. I mentioned the human research program before. We also have a lot of stuff in astromaterials. So it kind of depends on which area of physics. Um, and there's, uh, you don't have to answer that. My point is there's a lot of different areas, right? I just mentioned like quantum sensing. You can come, come do that for us, like that'd be great. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity. I'm happy to chat with you more afterwards as well. Also, I think we did just launch, you know, like our intern.nasa.gov. If you're interested in working at NASA as an undergrad, as a graduate student, um, I definitely encourage you to apply. But also know that NASA isn't the only place you can work in the space industry. There's a lot of companies in Houston that have internships and full-time positions uh, that you should check out as well, which maybe are, if not as exciting, maybe more exciting than what we're even doing at NASA. And we, we do have a, a student chapter of the Students for Exploration and Development in Space on, uh, here at the campus. So if you're interested, you can even be the physics lead for some of the ideas that they put forward. So uh, come back to us if you need to uh, connect. Um, but that's an organization. In fact, we have some folks in here who are connected with that, building our first ever CubeSat to do science. And so we need, we need, we need people in order to, to understand some of that science on the, the CubeSat side. So there's a lot of activities we're trying to build up too. So if some of them are sitting right next to you, you can talk to them. It looks like you already know a bunch of them. Um, so that's a way to help engage you. <laughs> well, he, knows, he knows everybody else too. You know, he knows everybody else too. So we have a couple of students online too. Um, again, uh, Eric, who's part of, he's, he's sort of leading up the, the kind of electronic side for, us, for a satellite. But he's got a really interesting question that's nothing to do with that. Um, he's asking, are there any plans to preserve historical artifacts on the moon as we return to it? That's a really good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that well enough to give you a definitive answer. I think you, I think he very much states a need right? So governance on the moon. What happens when we go back to the moon? Now, we in America often think about what that looks like from a peaceful purposes of outer space uh, perspective. We've trained you well to think about space in a peaceful way. And, you know, it's all kumbaya and, you know, sitting around the campfire on the moon. And in that world, you know, it might look a little different than in a world where space is militarized and weaponized and maybe we're more focused as a world on what it means to have war in space. And so all of that requires intentionality and governance and asking good questions like that. The, the Artemis Accords I mentioned before, that's why this is so important. We want to stack hands and have common understanding about what that looks like. It's the same thing as in the ocean, right? Rescue units, it's the same thing of like you go offshore, what are the laws and the, the rules that govern how you interact as a society. It's the same thing on the moon. The problem with the moon is it's it's a little bit the wild west. Who gets there first and has a sustainable presence and what does that look like? And they, you know, they, they might set up, uh, they might they might influence the direction it goes. So we care deeply about getting there soon. Yeah, and, I mean, there's, there's discussion about having it as a kind of UN identified historical preservation site, but Alan Bean, who was, was unfortunately passed away, was one of our speakers a few years ago. He was the fourth person to walk on the moon. And he tells a story of how when he got to the moon, he actually threw his silver wings. And as it was leaving his glove, he thought, is that my gold one? A gold one that says he's actually flown. And so it's buried somewhere in the lunar dust. Right. And I had this picture of a space tourist going up with a metal detector. And, and yeah. And selling on eBay, right? right. So, so we do have to think about if we are going to have a sustainable presence, we have to treat it in a way that we would like. You know, we yeah, we have to respect it, right? And it's, How do you do that? You're right. Yeah, it's hard. And, and you don't even need humans to pick it up, right? right? You could just have an autonomous vehicle that goes up there, collects it, takes it back, we sell it back on Earth. How do we feel about that? I don't, I don't know. It's a great question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe one more question? OK, so we have one. Two more. We'll we'll two more questions. From, we'll take one from the audience, and then we'll stop there. Or maybe, maybe Kristen, if this is a short question, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, I'm Fabiana, I'm one of the Italian companies that are here in Houston. Welcome. So, uh, you mentioned that everyone is welcome to your office, and you mentioned the space agencies. Yeah. What about foreign companies? Yep. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what about foreign com companies and foreign countries and foreigners? Are they welcome to our office? Are they welcome to work with us? So 
I'll answer, so Houston's a really great melting pot of places um, from around the world. I love, I think, are you, you're with an Italian startup? And there's a cohort of you that just started, right? is that all of you? All right, awesome. I think we've, we've hosted uh, the Italian delegation on campus at JSC twice, maybe this year already. Um, so we're constantly interacting with, with not only Italy, but other countries from around the world as well. I think we've actually had more international delegations in the past year than we've had in many, many years. Um, I always encourage people to check out, Rice University um, has a place called the ION, which I really consider as the town square of Houston, Texas. It's the place that we can all gather. They have a great watering hole for the morning in a coffee shop and for the afternoon. And it's a great place that we can meet kind of in a neutral territory that doesn't get into all the badging issues that sometimes that if you come visit us at NASA, it takes us a couple of months to process your badge. It can take a while. But we can always meet at the ION and we can talk about the work that you're doing. I'd, I'd love to do that. So thank you. And you are based at the ION. Yeah, yeah you're, you're based at the ION. So, so very, very nice. quickly, because uh, I really want to get you to dinner. So um, another, since it's a student, I think that's the key element for what we want to do here. So Kristen um, is one of our professional master students. She's asking about the role of microbiologists in amongst all of this discussion about technology. How do, how do microbiologists come into play when we're thinking about 2040 or human exploration? Yeah, that's a really good question because actually, so Houston at Johnson Space Center, we have a whole astrobiology group, astromaterials group. We care deeply about samples and returning those samples, curating those samples, understanding the science around it, and that quickly overlaps with the biology part of this as well. So sometimes when you hear about NASA, you think about engineers or technologists, but we also have a huge thriving science community as well. Uh, I didn't even mention it, but one of the most exciting things we have going on right now is Exploration Park at Johnson Space Center. It's the largest expansion of the, of the campus in nearly 60 years. And we'll be making an, an announcement soon on who will be kind of working with us on Exploration Park, but there's a huge opportunity for more research and science to be done in close proximity to JSC and in Houston, Texas, and we're hopeful for that. There's a lot of universities involved, um, Texas A&M University, Rice University, pretty much name a Texas university, they're probably involved in some way. And so that is a huge part of the work that we do. It's a huge part of the work we do at JSC, but also there's 10 other NASA centers, it's part of other NASA centers as well. So that's a really good question. Sometimes people can be like, oh, I'm not an engineer. Do I have any role at all in space exploration? And the answer is yes, you very, very much do. Yeah, if you want to survive on Mars, microbiology is your friend. So exactly. Um, this is, I mean, it was all very humble and so on. But, you know, I think this gives you a really, this is the first time, even we had Steve Rader talking about how NASA solves problems. This is the first time and, uh, in the series, in, in the long time it's running, that we've really had a visionary view of the future. And I think that's really built on what's happening today. And with people like, uh, and Ali's online, Ali's a, a great colleague, a, Nick, a wonderful person. Um, this is what's happening. And I think sometimes when we start thinking about rockets and astronauts and we think about how much things cost, we kind of forget this. And so I really think this was, uh, this, is gonna, this is a big highlight for, for our series. And I, again, I personally appreciate you being here, Nick, and everything you've done for us. And I'd like you all to join me in thanking you for this talk.